Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the, the dead come back, today, Mother? You? You What's the secret of the dead come back? The Taipan by W. Somerset Maugham No one knew better than he that he was an important person. He was number one in not the least important branch of the most important English firm in China. He had worked his way up through solid ability, and he looked back with a faint smile at the callow clerk who'd come out to China thirty years before. When he remembered the modest home he'd come from, a little red house in a long row of little red houses in Barnes, a suburb which, aiming desperately at the genteel, achieves only a sordid melancholy, and compared it with the magnificent stone mansion with its wide verandas and spacious rooms, which was at once the office of the company and his own residence. He chuckled with satisfaction. He had come a long way since then. He thought of the high tea to which he sat down when he came home from school. He was at St Paul's with his father and mother and his two sisters. A slice of cold meat, a great deal of bread and butter and plenty of milk in his tea everybody helping himself, and then he thought of the state in which he now ate his evening meal. He always dressed, and whether he was alone or not, he expected the three boys to wait at table. His number one boy knew exactly what he liked, and he never had to bother himself with the details of housekeeping, but he always had a set dinner with soup and fish, entree, roast, sweet and savoury, so that if he wanted to ask anyone in at the last moment he could. He liked his food, and he didn't see why, when he was alone, he should have less good dinner than when he had a guest. He had indeed gone far. That was why he didn't care to go home now. He had not been to England for ten years, and he took his leave in Japan or Vancouver, where he was sure of meeting old friends from the China coast. He knew no one at home. His sisters were married in their own station, their husbands were clerks and their sons were clerks. There was nothing between him and them. They bored him. He satisfied the claims of relationship by sending them every Christmas a piece of fine silk, some elaborate embroidery, or a case of tea. He was not a mean man, and as long as his mother lived he had made her an allowance, but when the time came for him to retire he had no intention of going back to England. He had seen too many do that, and knew how often it was a failure. He meant to take a house near the racecourse in Shanghai. What with bridge and his ponies and golf, he expected to get through the rest of his life very comfortably. But he had a good many years before he need think of retiring. In another five or six, Higgins would be going home and then he would take charge of the head office in Shanghai. Meanwhile, he was very happy where he was. He could save money, which you couldn't do in Shanghai, and have a good time into the bargain. This place had another advantage over Shanghai. He was the most prominent man in the community, and what he said went. Even the consul took care to keep on the right side of him. Once a consul and he had been at loggerheads and it was not he who had gone to the wall. The Taipan thrust out his jaw pugnaciously as he thought of the incident. But he smiled, for he felt in excellent humour. He was walking back to his office from a capital luncheon at the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. They did you very well there. The food was first rate and there was plenty of liquor. He had started with a couple of cocktails, then he had had some excellent sauterne, and he had finished up with two glasses of port and some fine old brandy. He felt good, and when he left he did a thing that was rare with him. He walked. His bearers with his chair kept a few paces behind him in case he felt inclined to slip into it, but he enjoyed stretching his legs. He didn't get enough exercise these days. Now that he was too heavy to ride, it was difficult to get exercise. But if he was too heavy to ride, he could still keep ponies. And as he strolled along in the balmy air, he thought of the spring meeting. He had a couple of griffins that he had hopes of, and one of the lads in his office had turned out a fine jockey. He must see they didn't sneak him away. Old Higgins in Shanghai would give a pot of money to get him over there. And he ought to pull off two or three races. He flattered himself that he had the finest stable in the city. He pouted his broad chest like a pigeon. It was a beautiful day and it was good to be alive. He paused as he came to the cemetery. It stood there neat and orderly as an evident sign of the community's opulence. He never passed the cemetery without a little glow of pride. He was pleased to be an Englishman. For the cemetery stood in a place valueless when it was chosen, 
which, with the increase of the city's affluence, was now worth a great deal of money. It had been suggested that the grave should be moved to another spot and the land sold for building, but the feeling of the community was against it. It gave the Taipan a sense of satisfaction to think that their dead rested on the most valuable site on the island. It showed that there were things they cared for more than money. Money be blowed. When it came to the things that mattered, this was a favourite phrase with the Taipan, well, one remembered that money wasn't everything. And now he thought he would take a stroll through. He looked at the graves. They were neatly kept and the pathways were free from weeds. There was a look of prosperity. And as he sauntered along, he read the names on the tombstones. Here were three side by side, the captain, the first mate and the second mate of the bark Mary Baxter, who had all perished together in the typhoon of 1908. He remembered it well. There was a little group of two missionaries, their wives and children who had been massacred during the Boxer Troubles. Shocking thing that had been. Not that he took much stock in missionaries, but hang it all, one couldn't have those damn Chinese massacring them. Then he came to a cross with a name on it he knew. Good chap, Edward Mulock. But he couldn't stand his liquor, drank himself to death, poor devil, at twenty-five. The Taipan had known a lot of them do that. There were several more neat crosses with a man's name on them, and the age, twenty-five, twenty-six, or twenty-seven. It was always the same story. They had come out to China, they had never seen so much money before. They were good fellows, and they wanted to drink with the rest. They couldn't stand it. And there they were, in the cemetery. You had to have a strong head and a fine constitution to drink, drink for drink on the China coast. Of course, it was very sad, but the Taipan could hardly help a smile when he thought of how many of these young fellows he had drunk underground. And there was a death that had been useful. A fellow in his own firm, senior to him, and a clever chap too. If that fellow had lived, he might not have been Taipan now. Truly, the ways of fate were inscrutable. Ah, and here was little Mrs. Turner, Violet Turner. She had been a pretty little thing. He had had quite an affair with her. He had been devilishly cut up when she died. He looked at her age on the tombstone. She'd be no chicken if she were alive now. And as he thought of all those dead people, a sense of satisfaction spread through him. He had beaten them all. They were dead and he was alive, and by George he'd scored them off. His eyes collected in one picture all those crowded graves, and he smiled scornfully. He very nearly rubbed his hands. No one ever thought I was a fool, he muttered. He had a feeling of good-natured contempt for the gibbering dead. Then, as he strolled along, he came suddenly upon two coolies digging a grave. He was astonished, for he had not heard that anyone in the community was dead. "'Who the devil's that for?' he said aloud. The coolies didn't even look at him. They went on with their work, standing in the grave deep down, and they shoveled up heavy clods of earth. Though he had been so long in China, he knew no Chinese. In his day it was not thought necessary to learn the damn language and they asked the coolies in English whose grave they were digging. They didn't understand. They answered him in Chinese, and he cursed them for ignorant fools. He knew that Mrs. Broom's child was ailing, and it might have died, but he would have certainly heard of it, and besides that wasn't a child's grave. It was a man's grave, and a big man's too. It was uncanny. He wished he hadn't gone into that cemetery. He hurried out and stepped into his chair. His good humour had all gone, and there was an uneasy frown on his face. The moment he got back to his office, he called to his number two. I say, Peters, who's dead? Do you know? But Peters knew nothing. The Taipan was puzzled. He called one of the native clerks and sent him to the cemetery to ask the coolies. He began to sign his letters. The clerk came back and said the coolies had gone and there was no one to ask. The Taipan began to feel vaguely annoyed. He did not like things to happen of which he knew nothing. His own boy would know. His boy always knew everything, and he sent for him. But the boy had heard of no death in the community. I knew no one was dead, said the Taipan irritably. But what's the grave for? He told the boy to go to the overseer of the cemetery and find out what the devil he had dug a grave for when no one was dead. Let me have a whiskey and soda before you go, he added, as the boy was leaving the room. He didn't know why the sight of the grave had made him uncomfortable, but he tried to put it out of his mind. He felt better when he drunk the whisky and finished his work. He went upstairs and turned over the pages of Punch. In a few minutes he would go to the club and play a rubber of two of bridge before dinner. 
but it would ease his mind to hear what his boy had to say, and he waited for his return. In a little while the boy came back, and he brought the overseer with him. "'What are you having a grave dug for?' he asked the overseer point-blank. "'Nobody's dead.' Uh, "'I dig no grave,' said the man. "'What the devil do you mean by that? There were two coolies digging a grave this afternoon.' The two Chinese looked at one another. Then the boy said they had been to the cemetery together. There was no new grave there. The Taipan only just stopped himself from speaking. But damn it all, I saw it myself with the words on the tip of his tongue. But he didn't say them. He grew very red as he choked them down. The two Chinese looked at him with their steady eyes. For a moment his breath failed him. All right, get out, he gasped. But as soon as they were gone, he shouted for the boy again, and when he came, maddeningly impassive, he told him to bring some whiskey. He rubbed his sweating face with a handkerchief. His hand trembled when he lifted the glass to his lips. They could say what they liked, but he had seen the grave. Why, he could hear still the dull thud as the coolies threw the spadefuls of earth on the ground above them. What did it mean? He could feel his heart beating. He felt strangely ill at ease. But he pulled himself together. It was all nonsense. If there was no grave, then it must have been a hallucination. The best thing he could do was to go to the club, and if he ran across the doctor, he would ask him to give him a look over. Everyone in the club looked just the same as ever. He didn't know why he should have expected them to look different. It was a comfort. These men, living for many years with one another, lives that were methodically regulated, had acquired a number of little idiosyncrasies. One of them hummed incessantly while he played bridge. Another insisted on drinking beer through a straw, and these tricks, which had so often irritated the Taipan, now gave him a sense of security. He needed it, for he could not get out of his head that strange sight he had seen. He played bridge very badly. His partner was censorious, and the Taipan lost his temper. He thought the men were looking at him oddly. He wondered what they saw in him that was unaccustomed. Suddenly he felt he could not bear to stay in the club any longer. As he went out, he saw the doctor reading the Times in the reading room, but he couldn't bring himself to speak to him. He wanted to see for himself whether that grave was really there, and stepping into his chair, he told his bearers to take him to the cemetery. You couldn't have a hallucination twice, could you? And besides, he would take the overseer in with him, and if the grave wasn't there, he would see it. And if it was, he'd give the overseer the soundest thrashing he'd ever had. But the overseer was nowhere to be found. He had gone out and taken the keys with him. When the Taipan found he couldn't get into the cemetery, he felt suddenly exhausted. He got back into his chair and told his bearers to take him home. He would lie down for a half hour before dinner. He was tired out, that was it. He had heard that people had hallucinations when they were tired. When his boy came in to put his clothes out for dinner, it was only by an effort of will that he got up. He had a strong inclination not to dress that evening, but he resisted it. He had made a rule to dress. He had dressed every evening for twenty years, and it would never do to break his rule. But he ordered a bottle of champagne with his dinner, and that made him feel more comfortable. Afterwards, he told the boy to bring him the best brandy. When he drank a couple of glasses of this, he felt himself again. Hallucinations be damned! He went to the billiard room and practised a few difficult shots. There couldn't be much the matter with him when his eye was so sure. When he went to bed, he sank immediately into a sound sleep. But suddenly... He awoke. He had dreamed of that open grave and the coolies digging leisurely. He was sure he'd seen them. It was absurd to say it was a hallucination when he'd seen them with his own eyes. Then he heard the rattle of the night watchman going his rounds. It broke upon the stillness of the night so harshly that it made him jump out of his skin, and then terror seized him. He felt a horror of the winding multitudinous streets of the Chinese city, and there was something ghastly and terrible in the convoluted roofs of the temples with their devils grimacing and tortured. He loathed the smells that assaulted his nostrils, and the people, those myriads of blue-clad coolies, and the beggars in their filthy rags, and the merchants and the magistrates sleek, smiling and inscrutable in their long black gowns. They seemed to press upon him with menace. He hated the country, China. Why had he ever come? He was panic-stricken now. He must get out. He would not stay another year, another month. What did he care about Shanghai? Oh, my God, he cried, if only I were safely back in England. He wanted to go home. If he had to die, he wanted to die in England. He couldn't bear to be buried among all these foreign men with their dark eyes and their grinning faces. 
He wanted to be buried at home, not in that grave he had seen that day. He could never rest there, never. What did it matter what people thought? Let them think what they liked. The only thing that mattered was to get away while he still had the chance. He got out of bed and wrote to the head of the firm and said he had discovered that he was dangerously ill. He must be replaced. He couldn't stay any longer than was absolutely necessary. He must go home at once. They found the letter in the morning, clenched in the Taipan's hand. He had slipped down between the desk and the chair. He was stone dead. That was the Taipan by um, W. Somerset Maugham, William Somerset Maugham. W. Somerset Maugham was born in 1873 in Paris and died in Nice in 1965. But despite that, both of those places being in France, he was actually English. He was a fantastically successful writer in his time and was in the 1930s the highest paid author. So I don't know who that would be the equivalent of, J.K. Rowling or Stephen King or somebody like that. He had a relatively, well, I say sad life. He was, he was orphaned aged 10 when both his parents died and he was um, then went under the guardianship of his uncle who was a clergyman, a vicar. Lots of vicars involved in writing ghost stories, but um, Mom didn't want to be a vicar. His father's family were all lawyers, didn't want to be one of those either. Anyway, his uncle was kind enough to send him to a private school at Canterbury, King's School, uh, but he didn't like that. He stuck it out for a bit and then refused to go back, and he was sent by his uncle to Heidelberg University, where he studied um, German literature. He didn't want to be... Uh, that wasn't his career, and he decided he wanted to be a doctor. So he went to St. Thomas's very famous old hospital in London and trained to be a doctor there and specialised in obstetrics. Well... Who would have thought it? And then um, he used his um, experience of being a doctor in that to write a, 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 a novel called Lisa of, Lisa of Lambeth, which focused on working class adultery and the consequences of it. And he was a very famous novelist, wrote lots of Moon and Sixpence, lots of very famous cakes and ale stories. And he's very good at talking about the subtleties of emotions and people, which is quite a modern thing. He also wrote a lot of good short stories, and most of them weren't ghost stories, but we've picked one that is. He, like many of the writers, he, he, he was married and had some kids, but later that didn't work out. And later he, he accused um, his wife of being pregnant when he first married her. So he said that the, the children who were ascribed to him weren't in fact his children, and that caused a lot of upset in later life. He was, he realised... He probably always knew that he was gay and he lived abroad with a gay partner. He travelled the world a lot and then he settled. And then in the First World War, he, uh, because of his medical training, he joined the Ambulance Corps and was recruited by uh, British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, and did jobs for them in Switzerland and in Russia. And then he wrote a few stories based on his experiences as a spy. So he lived a very colourful life. He was quite cutting about other people. And poor old Hugh Walpole, who uh, we read the story of his Out the Snow just before Christmas, got the rough edge of his tongue. And I think um, many other writers. So there we are. So coming to this story itself, the Taipan. A Taipan is a Cantonese word for the foreign leader of a thing called a Hong, which was a foreign enterprise, a foreign business established in China. And you'll know in the 19th century, the European powers went and did bad stuff in China and conquered bits of it and took bits of it and ex extorted um, favourable deals, much as they'd done in India as well, slightly earlier. And uh, this guy is the Taipan and he's head of, on an island, and I wonder if it's Hong Kong actually, but it's never mentioned, although he talks about going to Shanghai, which he never does, so it's not Shanghai, uh, and it's British. Uh, because, and, and I mean, it, what he's good at is he, he completely exposes the, this kind of person who would have been like that, who we see has had affairs, he's a drinker, he's racist, he doesn't really care about anybody, he's glad he's drunk these other poor young men under the table, and he's built up as a particularly unpleasant character. He's arrogant, he shouts at his servant that he calls boys. One of the things, of course, that you have to deal with when you're reading stories from this period is the casual racism that uh, was common 
to that class of people, well, probably everybody in those days, and that doesn't excuse it. So um, you have to be careful. I, I, I made some slight changes in the language, but I don't think it affa- affects. It was just things I couldn't read out, really descriptions of people which I, I wouldn't read out either so there we are so but the taipan gets what he deserves doesn't he again ghost stories are moral stories now i don't know if you can hear any of the noise in the background there's various things going on here we've got storm georgie i think that's it blasting us again we've had tons of storms since christmas just flooding the place and blowing things down we've got a few um flowers out the snowdrops are out the crocuses are out and the buds of the daffodils are starting to show so that's very pleasant but the poor old flowers are being drowned and blasted but it's nice to see some signs of spring and i hope things are going well where you are which leads me neatly a neat segue i was saying it's noisy because i've got i'm cooking breakfast in the background and the washing machine's on so i've put some gates on it to kind of uh, cut that out but i hope it isn't too noisy um where do people listen to the ghost uh, classic ghost stories podcast well um some the bulk of people the majority of people listen in the united states and i think just recently in this last month we've had 6484 downloads from the states next is the united kingdom with 4799 and we drop australia is next then Canada, then Ireland, then India, then South Africa, then Norway, then Germany, then New Zealand, Sweden, then Singapore, then Poland, Chile, I could go on, Turkey, Spain, Netherlands, Ukraine, Philippines, Bangladesh. This is incredible, you know, that people are listening to the stories for such a far and wide spread across the world. Very, very pleasing. And things are growing so much. We started off when I first put the first episode up, I think we got 100 downloads and i put the new episodes up and we're getting 800 within a day you know so that's amazing i, I have there's some th- there's all sorts of things i want to say i want to thank the supporters i want to thank the patreons who consistently support i've had a, ve- a lot of coffees bought for me this week um carissa bought me five coffees uh, on february the 28th and valerie sawyer bought me three coffees and i'm absolutely uh, delighted with that. That's fantastic. It's just such a, a show of appreciation. It really helps pay the podcasting costs. But um, I haven't slept since I've had those five coffees. No, that's not true. I, I've only had, I've only converted them into two coffees, which is, is tolerable. So again, thank you very, very much for your support, the ongoing support. It means a lot. You can please keep doing it. Please keep supporting the show. Please keep sharing the show. I shouldn't do more than one call to action. You know, I've learned that. I've got a new book out. It's it's on pre-order now. It's called Dark Worlds Paris. This is a like a side project of me doing these for years. Wrote wrote various fantasy books and things. And this is a, a Cthulhu lit RPG story. So if you don't know what that is, go on the show notes and click through Dark Worlds Paris by Tony Walker. Basically, it's set in a computer game, but the computer game is in 1927 in Paris. So it's a virtual reality and um, it's Cthulhu. So in the code, the great old ones, which are Cthulhu's nameless monsters, have generated themselves in the code or the code um, has decided to call itself that and it's infiltrating people's brains. So the first one was Dark Worlds London. There was a slight one beforehand called Arkham Interlude, which is set in Arkham, the mythical Arkham in New England. And that was, uh, there's an audiobook of that coming out and narrated by a very talented, and I hope my friend as well, Damon Allams, who's got a great voice. And so when that comes out, I'll let you know. There'll be some free copies available for review. But Dark Worlds London hasn't got an audiobook. It's got a paperback and Dark Worlds Paris is, has got a paperback, but it's, it's on pre-order. So it's just to let you know. Anyway, that's just, I was talking and Sheila said to me, she said, you should advertise these things. Uh, you never know. Somebody might like them. I, I'm like, well, they're not classic ghost stories. They're, they're horror-ish. It's like Call of Cthulhu. If you've ever played Call of Cthulhu game in a, in a virtual reality game. So that's what that is. Everything else is, is splendid. Anyway, yeah, no, that's great. So thanks again for the support. The story this week, the Taipan, is relatively short. I've already recorded The Hound by H.P. Lovecraft for next week, uh, which again is relatively short. But I'm pretty busy. But I've got ideas. Because I was thinking because I know where people are listening, I want to do an Australian. I'd love to do a Picnic at Hanging Rock, but I think it's too long. Great film. Fantastically, weirdly wonderful. Some great stuff comes out of Australia, you know. 
and that's not to put anybody else down. Everybody, there's a lot of stuff. I would love to do an Indian ghost story as well. But there we are. Okay, everybody. See you next week. Isn't that so? Isn't that so?